Good morning. Hi, this is Mark Winwood, an old friend of the membership. I'm broadcasting from the Seattle, Washington area. I used to be in Florida and would regularly attend um, Sunday morning and then actually some beyond the Sunday morning um, meetings introducing ideas of Tibetan Buddhism, hopefully practical ideas of Tibetan Buddhist practice, not looking to create more Buddhists, but looking to create uh, or help people be happier, more wholesome, uh, more stable um, individuals. So I am delighted to be back and I thank you for inviting me once again. What I would like to talk about today is a, um, it's actually a very um, iconically famous foundational Tibetan Buddhist teaching it's called the, the Diamond Sutra, or the perfection of wisdom that cuts like a diamond. And before I even get into any of the, um, the practicalities, I would like to say that this is a very historical document. It was discovered in a cave in 1907 in China. And remarkably, when uh, the archaeologists and the scholars got to it, they discovered that it was dated. There was actually a date on it, and through some kind of algorithms or translations, um, that date was found to equate to May 11th of the year 868 on our calendar. Um, this document was printed, it was block printed, and that makes it the very, very oldest printed document ever discovered. It actually predates the Gutenberg Bible by 600 years and um, is on display. I've actually seen it. It was on display at the uh, British Museum, you know, in that room where they have the Magna Carta and the Shakespearean texts and so on. It's an unbelievable room to be in. If you ever get a chance to go when the COVID thing is over, if you have a chance to go back to London, check out that room. It's wonderful. So um, this is a document, it's known as a, one of the wisdom teachings, the perfection of wisdom teachings. And the way that Buddhism developed through um, Siddhartha and then all the lineage of teachers that came after Siddhartha and to this present day, Buddhism is usually taught along two um, simultaneous or interactive paths, the path of method, in terms of how we are and what we do, how we speak, how we relate to others. And, you know, there's ethics and morality and patience and generosity and all kinds of wonderful qualities. But then, and then there's the other track, which is the track of wisdom. It's the track of understanding how things truly exist, how I truly exist, how I truly exist in relation to others, the path of wisdom. And those two paths are interactive. They're kind of like left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. The more we understand, the greater our ability to, to naturally and intuitively adhere to the methodologies. And then the more we adhere to the methodologies, the clearer our mind becomes, the less con conflicted and confused our mind becomes. And then the, um, the wisdom blossoms even more. So it's a very progressive path, method and wisdom. And the Diamond Sutra is one of the wisdom. It's one of the wisdom teachings. In fact, the title, the Diamond Sutra, um, is a shortened version of the perfection of wisdom that cuts like a diamond. And what, as we know, a diamond is the hardest material. It cuts through anything. And what the diamond, the wisdom of the diamond cuts through is our ignorance, our ignorance. The Diamond Sutra cuts through ignorance with wisdom. It's a profound teaching. It is a teaching of what's known as the Mahayana path. You've probably heard of the Mahayana path. The Mahayana path, um, Mahayana is an interesting word. It's broken by Maha and Yana. Maha refers to great. Yana is a vehicle or a path or a way of getting or progressing from one place to another. So the Mahayana path is the great path or the great vehicle. And what it, that word Maha refers to in terms of great is not just great because like, wow, it's really great, but it refers to it's great in terms of it applies to every being. It is great in its vastness. It is great in its scope. 
It's non-discriminatory. It is great in terms of its application to all beings. It is all inclusive. The Mahayana path is all inclusive. And the, the, the methodology of the Mahayana path is for one to practice, one to grow, one to evolve, one to develop the capabilities to be as, as wisely, skillfully helpful to all beings as one possibly can. The, that path is known as the bodhisattva path, and one who travels that path and commits to that path is known as a bodhisattva. So you've probably heard that word bodhisattva before. This is what it refers to. It's a warrior, a Buddhist warrior. It sounds kind of strange, perhaps. We don't think of warriors as being Buddhist, but one who is out there to help all beings uh, navigate beyond the causes of their ignorance and confusion and suffering, that is a warrior's path because there's a lot of it out there. So that is the Mahayana path. I'm sorry, the Bodhisattva path. So this teaching refers specifically to the Bodhisattva path. And I have, you, you hopefully have a handout of this or you have access to a handout. I've excerpted little pieces and I'm going to share them with you. I'll read them and then we'll talk about them. So this teaching begins um, that the Buddha was staying at a particular place where he used to gather and he used to give teachings. It was a grove um, in northern India, a city known as Srivasti at the time. It's about 2,500 years ago. He was there with his monks, with his disciples, with his followers, with his students. And, um, and one of his monks approached him. And in the nature of sutras, the teachings is usually a question and then an answer, and usually an audience that's hearing this. And this monk's name is Sabuti. And Sabuti asks the Buddha, Siddhartha, asks the Buddha, what should one who wants to travel the Bodhisattva path keep in mind? Very general, broadly encompassing question. What should one who wants to travel the Bodhisattva path keep in mind? How, do, how does somebody do this? It's pretty challenging. How does somebody do this? So the Buddha starts off and he says, I'm going to read, a bodhisattva should keep this in mind. All creatures, whether they are born from the womb or hatched from the egg, whether they transform like butterflies or arise miraculously, whether they have a body or a purely spirit, whether they are capable of thought or not capable of thought, all of these I vow to help enter nirvana, state of clarity and brilliance, before I rest there myself. Starts off with that. So again, the state of nirvana that one is helping all beings achieve is a state of mind in which the causes and confusions are eliminated. Um, Siddhartha actually um, has stated that there are 84,000 afflictive states of mind, known as kleshas, afflictive states of mind, emotions, moods, perspectives, 84,000. In the when the mind is in the state of nirvana, they're gone. They are they are uh, uh, just distant memories. They're gone. The state of nirvana. So. That mind is pure and it's clean and it's wise and it is, it is achieving all of its deepest potential, the state of nirvana. So consider what this statement says, that a bodhisattva, before he or she gets to this state, his job is to help everyone else achieve that state before he takes that over. Um, this is a... Uh, so there's that great, the Mahayana, all inclusive, all beings, no matter how they have come to be, no matter who they are, not just people, how they've come to be. Um, this is who the Bodhisattva is working for and working with. It is quite different from many of the uh, Judeo-Christian notions of uh, man having, or humans having dominion over animals, over the animal realm and so on. And, and if you really think about this, you can probably begin to see um, where the, the connection, and there is a connection with many people, but not all, and it's not required, a connection between um, what we eat, vegetarianism and, and Buddhism and animals and so on, because if we consider all beings to be equally important, we're not gonna start eating some. 
um, and the way we treat others as well, where all beings are equally important. So, um, so that's a, it's a very inclusive statement and it's something to consider perhaps in our own, our own perspectives. Um, and it's challenging and consider where it really gets kind of difficult because this isn't just talking about caring for others. This isn't just talking about considering in, in the most important of ways, the welfare of others. What we're talking about here is the bodhisattva is putting the happiness of others ahead of his or her own. The happiness, the intuitive, instinctive happiness that we all crave, that we're all looking for, that your happiness is more important than mine, and I will do what I need to do. I will engage in whatever you're going through in terms of your challenges to help you be happy before me. And that's kind of where the challenge is in this bodhisattva path is working on that kind of level, that the depth of that level. Um, takes some real commitment and it takes some real uh, uh, courage to commit to that path. Um, the Buddha then says to Sabuti, uh, Sabuti, can you measure the distance of the east and the west and the north and the south? I've always liked this line. Can you measure the distance of the east, west, north and south? And Sabuti says, no. Um, and the Buddha then says, Neither can you measure the merit of someone who can help others without thought of himself. So we all know where East is and West. You're East of me right now, and et cetera. Um, but there's no limit. East is just a direction and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on forever. Um, and the Buddha is using that metaphor, as he did a lot. He taught a lot in metaphor. He's using that metaphor of the unlimited distance, the unlimited direction or the unlimited amount for the amount of merit. Merit is unblossomed in the mind, ready to explode virtue and skill. That's what merit refers to. So one who is engaged on this path is putting into their mind all these incredible capabilities that will blossom and there's no limit. There is no limit to them. There's no boundary, there's no border. There's no wall. It just goes on and on and on. The vastness, again, there's, there's part of that maha, mahayana, the great, the greatness of this scope, the greatness of this vehicle. The Buddha then says to Sabuti, Sabuti, if someone gave away enough treasure to fill a universe, it's a lot of treasure, enough treasure to fill a universe, he would still not gain as much merit, there's that word, merit, as someone who manages to understand and pass on a few lines of this sermon, of this teaching. Um, the benefit, the value, this is coming from the Buddha. This is a man, uh, an individual who has done the work, the internal work to understand what is truly, truly wise, beneficial, responsible, interconnected, the absolute beauty of his mind and in, of his mind, of all minds potentially as well, all sentient minds, regardless whether in a human being or a salmon or an anteater or an insect, the sentient mind. Mm -hmm. He has come to understand the beauty of that. And he has come to understand that this idea, these ways of being are how to achieve and blossom and experience that beauty. That's what he's talking about. So here he says, a treasure full, uh, the universe full of treasures isn't even close to the, to the merit, to the benefit, to the value of these understandings and helping others see them as well. Um, from the Buddhist side, I think many of you are, are aware that Buddhism is a, uh, uh, a philosophy that believes and talks a lot about rebirth. And it is, you know, you can have a universe full of treasures in your possession, but when you die, it's not going with you anywhere. You're leaving that behind. But yet the mind of these, these virtues these virtuous seeds and sensibilities that are in the mind, that goes with you 
the mind goes out and goes with you and takes its rebirth. And those, those benefits and virtues are still resonant within that mind. So this, this idea of these notions being more valuable in a universe full of treasures has its bearing as well in timelessness because the treasures are left behind. You go off to your next, but what's in your mind goes along with you. So um, if you are a financial person um, or you have financial sensibilities and you believe in long-term planning, as many advisors say we should perhaps, um, this is the long-term planning. What you're doing here with these teachings, with this ideas, is you are you are investing in the long term because the long term is your mind. It's going to go on and on and on and on and on. That's the long term investment. Anything else that you're investing is the short term investment because when you're gone, it's gone as well. So consider that notion of investing in one's mind um, and these guidelines for doing that. So the um, Buddha then rephrases, and this is a, um, again, a typical um, format of his teachings. He then comes to a conclusion and he takes the teaching, he takes the question that's asked at the very beginning and he rephrases it. And then he ties it into a nice little package. Mm -hmm. And he says, so what should be on one's mind as one begins the Bodhisattva journey? And then he answers, and this is, I think, a uh, poetically famous statement that he makes. He says, like a star, a cataract, a butter lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew, a water bubble, like a dream, a bolt of lightning, a cloud, view all compounded phenomena in this way. And that's the statement pretty much there's some after afterward, but this is the statement with which he concludes this teaching. And this is, uh, this is big. This is a really wonderful, wonderful um, idea. It's a wonderful notion. I will, um, it's big and I'll try to explain it to you in the next 15 minutes. Um, when Siddhartha became enlightened, became the Buddha, and he went out and he gave his very first teaching. Uh, to people he used to study with. And he explained to them that in uh, what's known as the Four Noble Truths, that all sentient life is full, of, is full of dukkha or full of anxiety and confusion and discontent and ignorance and anger and all this stuff. Um, all of our minds are full of that. And the reason that they're full of that, it's always there, is because we just don't really understand the way things are. We see things as being very material and real and obtainable and consistent and so on. But really, everything is impermanent. Everything is in flux. And if we can stop and just consider, if we can stop and think about how not just ourselves, but everything around us, every person, every everything we see, everything we touch, everything we smell, everything around us is in flux, constantly changing it makes it really difficult to try to grab onto it and hold on to it and keep it from changing because everything's changing all the time. And if we can begin to understand, if we can begin to really see that, then what happens is our grasping, that thing that brings about all our anxieties and so on, our grasping, we begin to loosen our grip because we know that we can't hold on to it. It's always changing. It's impermanent. It's always changing. And by releasing our, our grasping or our attaching and, and so on, what happens is our mind in, in connection with that begins to, begins to lighten. It begins to become more flexible. It begins to become a little clearer. And the causes of our suffering, our ignorance, and so on, uh, begin to minimize. So this last paragraph in the Diamond Sutra deals exactly with that. The Buddha is explaining to Subhuti to see all what he calls compounded phenomena in a particular way. So what is a compounded phenomena? Scientific term. It's really simple to understand. The idea of a compounded phenomena 
is that anything and everything that you are encountering and just as you sit there, just look around, look at the computer screen that you're on, look at, look at the clothes you're wearing, whatever it is, everything that exists, exists because it's pieces of things that have come together. Nothing just exists all by itself, immediately, immaculately, perfectly there. Nothing is like that. Everything is a, is a, a compound. It's a, it's a collection of things that have come together. And everything that comes together ultimately ages, matures, decays, and falls apart. Everything is impermanent. Everything, every moment is, is moving and changing and morphing and, and so on. And it's one of the things that meditation teaches us is we begin to watch our thoughts. We begin to see, oh my gosh, that's true of my thoughts as well. That's true of my mind. We watch our thoughts arise. We experience them. We watch them go. Something else comes, et cetera, et cetera. Feelings, emotions, and all that begin. So we understand that everything is a compounded phenomena. Everything is changing. And the Buddha says to Siddhartha, there's these eight metaphors. And he says, view all compounded phenomena in these ways. So let's look at what these eight compounded phenomena are. He says, like a star, view everything to be like a star. Well, what's a star? The stars are up in the sky. They're very, very far away. We can't really see exactly what they, what they are, what's emanating that light. Um, we do know that during the day, we don't see stars, but we see them at night. But they're there during the day as well. We just can't see them. So he's saying to Sabuti, view all everything in your life that as something that you can't really perfectly see the way it is at all times. Understand that, see that. Don't grasp on to just this little view that you have when there's so much more, like a star. He says like a cataract. If some of us have cataracts in our eyes, we understand what cataracts do to our sight. They make it foggy, they, they cloud it up. We don't see clearly what we're looking at like a cataract, same idea, same idea. Don't think that whatever you see, you completely and truly understand with perfect clarity and brilliance, because you don't. There's cloudiness involved that you can't really discern. Um, a butter lamp. Butter lamps are um, not so popular here in America, but over um, in India and so on, um, butter lamps are used as all different kinds of uh, uh, ceremonies and practices and so on for butter lamps. And the thing about butter lamps, if you've ever seen one, is they are very, um, they're very uh, unstable. Butter lamps will flare up and they'll flare down. A breeze can blow them out. The butter ultimately disappears and the lamp will go out. So the idea about see everything as a butter lamp is that um, at this moment, you might be seeing things clearly. At the next moment, you might not be seeing things very clearly because the flame rises and, and sinks. It goes back and forth based on the wind. So it's a, it's a very profound statement, actually, to see things like a butter lamp. If you consider the qualities of a butter lamp and take those qualities and apply them to whatever it is you're seeing, hearing, thinking, feeling, tasting, smelling, or thinking, those are the phenomena, all phenomena. If you apply that notion to those phenomena, you begin to get the picture of not grasping, of not grasping and holding on and needing to hold on to something. He says like an illusion, see things like an illusion. And um, the way I like to explain this is um, consider that you're in the movies. When the movies reopen, they're, they're not open out here in, in Washington state. I don't know about Florida, but you're in the movies and you're sitting there in the front row and it's a really good movie and you're really enjoying it. And what you're really enjoying, if you consider, is you're looking at a bunch of light being projected on a screen um, and, and you're into the movie and you're rooting for the good guys and you, you hope that the lovers get together at the end and, you know, whatever the plot of the movie is and you get emotionally involved, you know, you're like really, and you really enjoy the movie, but it's all an illusion. It's not real. It's not really happening. It's just a bunch of light on a screen, but there you are. And Siddhartha is saying to Sabuti, see everything like that. 
See everything like that, because that's really how things are. You're, you're living within your perceptions of things. It's what you see and feel and think and so on. That's where you're living. It's like, see it all like an illusion and don't attach to it. The beauty of a movie is, you know, it's going to be over. And, and Godzilla destroys the city and you walk out of the theater and it's fine because, well, it's not really, it didn't really happen. Tokyo's still there, just a movie. Well, maybe our lives are kind of like that as well. Something to consider. See things like an illusion. A drop of dew. This is the uh, one of the highlights or one of the um, uh, really pr clear statements of impermanence. If you walk out early in the morning before the sun's up, for the, and certainly in Florida with that warm sun, um, if you walk out into the field, there's dew on the grass. Little beautiful drops of water on the, on the tips of the blades of grass. But as soon as the sun comes up and the heat of the sun, the dew is gone. It either drops off or it evaporates. It is com it's beautiful and it's impermanent. It doesn't last. Um, and this is one way, again, to perceive, if you will, uh, the environment around you, like a drop of dew, drop of dew. Beautiful, but impermanent. Don't attach to it. Don't, attach, don't get sad at three o'clock in the afternoon when there's no more dew on the grass. Okay, it'll be back in the morning, but it's not there now, I'm permanent. A bolt of lightning. A lot of lightning in Florida, I remember. Not so much here, maybe twice in the last six years or so. Um, but what happens, especially in the evening, when a bolt of lightning, first of all, it's unexpected. Um, it just comes. One moment, you have no idea. Next moment, all of a sudden, at night, you see everything. You see everything everything, and then it's gone, it's dark again. So understand that at any point in time, anything that you are encountering is capable of illuminating something you have not seen before, is capable of providing for you an aha, a realization, an insight. Every moment, everything is capable of providing that for you if you just keep your eyes open. Keep your mind open. Keep your mind fertile. Keep your mind penetrable and flexible. Everything is capable of providing insight for you, like a bolt of lightning. And then the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped like, uh, I skipped a couple, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. Like a water bubble. Water bubble is kind of like a drop of dew. If you've sat alongside a stream, and you've watched the water bubble, it comes up out of the water, basically, it's beautiful, it glides along and it pops and it's gonna pop pretty quickly, you never know when it's going to pop. Um, see things, again, that's about the impermanence of things. There they are, and now they're gone. Um, and like a dream. Um, there has been um, scientific research um, brain research that shows that when people are dreaming, they're having very similar um, physical reactions, blood pressure, and so on, to what they would be having if they weren't dreaming. Um, and the idea of seeing things like a dream is kind of like an illusion. It's the same idea. Um, we understand that our, we wake up from a dream when you go, oh my gosh, it was just a dream. Well, maybe this life is, oh my gosh, it was just a moment of life. Maybe it's not as real as I thought it was. Maybe it's all put together by my perceptions, just like our dreams are, my memories and so on. Um, don't attach to everything. Just go with the flow. Keep waking up. Keep waking up from it. Keep moving beyond. Keep looking and putting into perspective things. It's the idea of like a dream. Sorry, I skipped a couple there. And then like a cloud, and of these metaphors, this is my favorite one. Um, and this refers to the idea that everything that is occurring at this moment leads to other things. Thich Nhat Hanh, some of you may know the Vietnamese monk, Thich Nhat Hanh um, is, has, has said this very, very beautifully, where he says, if you look at a piece of paper, can you see a tree? Can you see the tree in a piece of paper? The idea of like a cloud is if you consider the cloud in the sky, um, it brings rain. 
and the water falls and falls onto the onto the field, and it um, it helps the seeds that are in the in the ground. Um, it moisturizes them. It allows them to blossom. The seeds then grow and they turn into a corn, a stalk of corn, and the ears of corn then go on to feed several people or, or animals or whatever the case may be. The idea of seeing things like a cloud is seeing that everything around us at every moment is, 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 a, is setting the stage for other things to happen setting the stage for other things to happen. So when you look at a cloud, can you see the sunflowers that are going to blossom in your field in two months? Can you see that? Um, and can you see the connection between them and therefore not have these attachments and these ideas, these stiff, narrow-minded ideas of what things are now? Can you see what they hold for the time to come? This is Siddhartha's advice to Subhuti. This is how the Bodhisattva sees things in all these different ways. And by seeing things in these ways, it enables the Bodhisattva to, to be present, to be wise, to be clear thinking, to be responsive, but non-reactive. Consider the difference between response and reaction. Um, and this is how the Bodhisattva um, goes uh, along along his way. This is how the Bodhisattva goes along his way. So those are just some of the of the teachings, some of the ideas that are that are communicated in the Diamond Sutra. Um, and I think that just in summary, it's it's really beneficial for us to um, to really think about this and um, these teachings and maybe how they relate to us. You know, I mean, Buddhism's wonderful. These teachings are great. They're 2,500 years old. And the idea of reading Buddhist teachings and lots of other things um, is to see, well, what's there for now? How does this relate to me now? That's why we study. That's why we practice. How do we make this for now? Mm -hmm. um, so what did the, what did the, the, the Buddha do? Um, in his teachings, he, he taught us how we use our minds and how we very, very narrowly use our minds. You can see some of the perspectives that are presented here um, in the Diamond Sutra. Um, and he, um, he, he teaches us to really see things in a, our lives and those around us in a, perhaps in a new direction. Um, you know, you know, I actually think, it just came to mind, I actually think Unitarian, the Unitarian uh, uh, Universalist, um, aren't Emerson and Thoreau, weren't they some of the, uh, the sources, their ideas, some of their writings, aren't they, isn't a lot of what uh, you use, uh, look at and see things in the way of Emerson and Thoreau. And, oh my gosh, if you start really rereading Emerson and Thoreau and you happen to read a Buddhist teaching alongside those every now and then, Similarities are remarkable. They're really, really remarkable. I think these these Buddhist notions, some of these Buddhist notions, really do relate um, to the uh, to the UU UU Church, UU people, UU minds. Um, and uh, I, I I encourage you um, dig in, and and uh, um, you all can you have my contact information. I'd be happy to send information, et cetera, et cetera, whatever it is, any questions that you might have. Um, but there really is, it, it's one of the reasons I enjoyed going and speaking um, to you guys um, so often um, because we're kindred, we were kindred. What I was seeing and studying and what you were seeing and studying are kindred. So um, I encourage you to keep that going. And um, I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit about the, actually a lot of a little bit or a little bit of a lot about the Diamond, the Diamond Sutra um, and how some of these insights may or may not, um, but may infuse your experiences of your path, of the UU path, of your own path. Um, I think this is, con this is worthy of, of time and, uh, and contemplation. So thank you again. And uh, I'll sign off and, and this is being broadcast on April 11 and I'll be online to answer any, any questions that you might have. So um, thank you so very, very much. I really appreciate being here.
Bye-bye.